Hey everyone, we are live at the Pace Studio right now with Ben Lee. And Ben, welcome back, man. It's great to see you. Well, again. thank you so much. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Juliana, Juliana Barwick, it was wonderful to meet you. And thanks for coming and doing this. Uh, we are looking forward to sharing your music with the internet right now. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, so congratulations to you because Quarter Century Classics just came out on New West Records on uh, just uh, just before Thanksgiving, mm-hmm. and um, and it's out in the world right now. We're gonna hear three songs from it. Can you tell us a little bit about what's coming up first? Yeah, well, so th- th- this album, so people get it, it's a covers album, um, which is something I haven't done before. And it happened sort of very organically. I got stuck in Chicago in a hotel room during the Polar Vortex, uh, the beginning of the year. And I was thinking about Chicago sort of a provocative place for me. And I made my first record there, Grandpa Wood, in 93. Um, so just being there and also being weirdly isolated in this hotel. Um, I was just thinking about my first trip there and all the music I loved and Mm. started playing some of the the songs and all the bands that I was so obsessed with and the vinyl I was, you know, collecting. And, um, and I basically like had a little studio set up and I just sketched out this covers record that is, it's basically like a tribute to in a way, like the ancestors of indie rock, you know, because that's like the the landscape that I grew up in, like Sonic Youth, Dinosaur Junior. Like I kept saying to people, Sonic Youth were my Grateful Dead. You know, Jay Mascus was my Jimmy Page. Built to Spill were my Steve Miller band. You know, like we each have our personal classic rock. And for me, that's what I related to. So, so I just sketched out this covers record and then got back to LA and got some friends like Juliana involved to flesh it out. And um, I'm going to play you some songs from it. So uh, the first one we're going to do is uh, a song by The Breeders called Divine Hammer. I'm just looking for, looking for a way around Disappears this near You're the rod and water I'm just looking for the divine hammer One divine hammer One divine hammer I'm just looking for one Divine hammer, I'd bang it all day. Oh, the carpenter goes bang, bang, bang. I'm just looking for one divine hammer. One divine hammer. One divine. for faith waiting to be followed it disappears this near you're the rod of water I'm just looking for one divine hammer one divine hammer one divine
<laughs> All right. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Juliana. That sounds great. Thank you so much. Yeah, man. Um, so we we got a little bit of a chance to talk offline about the uh, what's what these tapes all are behind you. And you mentioned that that uh, Sonic Youth is your Grateful Dead, Jay Maskus, your Jimmy Page. I mean, all of that stuff, Sonic Youth, the Grateful Dead, Jimmy Page, Zeppelin, Dinosaur Jr. is sitting on the walls behind you right now. Um, can we talk a little bit further about who has influenced you, who ends up on this record? Can you talk actually more about more about who is on this record apart from the Breeders? Yeah. And there's yeah, a lot of yeah. uh, um, golden a indie rock represented here. Fugazi song, um, Beat Happening, Guided by Voices, uh, Pavement. Uh, I know I'm forgetting some, but uh, yeah. Archers. Archers of Loaf. Yeah. Um, it's funny because uh, I was thinking a lot about how, you know, the album's called Quarter Century Classics because it's music from about 25 years ago. And if we were in 1990 talking about music from 25 years ago, that would be 1965. And it would basically be unanimous what the classic music from that era is, right? But music has become so segmented and um, kind of compartmentalized that it's interesting to sort of, I guess in a way, what I, the feedback I'm getting from a lot of people is like... Um, a lot of people seeing their formative time musically not yet canonized, which, you know, this period of music influenced um, a lot of people my age, but it's sort of it, pop culture, I think, doesn't quite know what to do with that because it's not necessarily bands that had hit records that are going to be played alongside Leonard Skinner or something on the radio. So, um, I mean, for me, you know, every whatever you grow up with, you end up pushing against also. So a lot of the constraints of indie rock came to be something I felt, particularly in my 20s, I had to push against to assert my ambition. And uh, it's almost like you go, I want to do what I think is cool, not what Thurston Moore says is cool. You know, it's like it becomes almost like parents, like you project a tribal thing on it. And so it's been really great at this point in my life to go back as an adult. It's, it's like when you have kids and then you realize your parents didn't do such a bad job and you thank them. You know what I mean? It's been kind of cool for me to kind of go back to all these heroes and just say, thank you. You know, my life wouldn't be the same without Slant and Enchanted by Pavement. You know, the, these records, um, they did, they were more than just an aesthetic. They kind of, there was like a spiritual quality and an, an approach to music and culture and values for life that I sort of got from all these records when I was, you know, 13, 14, 15 years old. Well, man, did you, that's got, Thurston's got to be a difficult, per, if you're trying to push back against an aesthetic, he's got to be a difficult one to push back against because he sounds so many different ways every time he goes out and makes something. It's got to be, uh, if, if you're looking for somebody to push back, he's something of a yeah, chameleon to yeah. push back no, against. That's true. But, you know, like with underground music, it's like anything, wherever there's culture, there's... Um, there's tribalism and there's conformity and not necessarily on the part of the artists. Like I remember Mike Watts saying to me once when punk rock started, every band was different, but then the next wave that comes along, it becomes stricter, you know? And I've always felt like the most punk thing is to do what you want to do. Uh, but it's not always perceived that way within scenes, you know, so, so yes, obviously the pioneers of, uh, of all this music, I think very open-minded and stuff, but as like a next wave person coming along, you perceive that there's, there's still walls that have to be torn down and there's, you know, we each have to carve our own path. We can't just be, it's like, we have to respect the path, but we also have to create our own future. And I think that is finding that balance is part of, for me at this moment in my musical evolution, like really important to me, like kind of going where I want to go, but still staying connected to things from my past. You know? Well, dude, that was very, very eloquently said. Thank you for sharing all that. <laughs> and you. we've got, man, if you want to poke around any more at some of these tapes, I know you saw when you came in with Josh Radner a couple of years ago, you saw yeah. saw the rest of the collection, but there, there's a Mike Watt tape with, uh, it's Mike Watt on the A side of this DAT tape and Foo Fighters on the B side. Um, What'd you find there? I just pulled off Pig Vomit. Yeah, dude, that's Howard Stern's band. Oh, I wonder. I knew the name was familiar, but I was like, what is Pig Vomit? <laughs> okay. Yeah, Pig Vomit's, what, what's that sitting next to? Like a, a uh, Tina Turner, maybe? There's a Prince tape right up there oh, as well. Please. The Police. That can just go on the ground up for oh, now. really? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Um, dude, Stuart Copeland came in here and did one of these not too, too long ago. It also, the Pig Vomit also came with like some kind of an angel card or something. <laughs> 
That is a emphatically not a tarot card. It okay. is, I forget what she called it, but Cat Cunning, the artist. Uh, oh, she okay, came in here cool. and did one of these about two months ago and okay. left these. Uh, Just next to the pig vomit reel. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> yeah. That's and good. that's that candle right behind you, Juliana. That's uh, that's also Cat Cunning's candle. Got um, uh, swag all over. Yeah. And while we're um, uh, mentioning Juliana, everyone should listen to Juliana's music. She's an incredible artist and Juliana Barwick and just, track down everything she's ever done and everything she does in the future because I'm very lucky <laughs> that she's singing with me and she's an incredible, incredible artist. Yeah. Nice. Well, thank you both yeah. for your time very yeah. much. And uh, there is more music coming up. Can you tell us yeah, what you're going to do, do uh, a second and a third song yeah, from yeah, yeah. Quarter yeah. Century Classics? What's coming up next? Uh, this is a song by Archers of Loaf. It's called Web in Front. For me, it was probably the greatest seven-inch single that was ever released. It's up there with like Be My Baby. This is like one of my favorite pop, pop songs ever. Stuck a pin in your backbone, spoke it down from there All I ever wanted was to be your spine Lost your friction and you slid for a mile Overdone, overdrive, overlive, override You're not the one who let me down but thanks for offering It's not a voice and you're not around Picking it up on the radio Sampled your rust from a faucet I know I got a magnet in my head, magnet in my head Extra thick, extra long, the weight was wasted And there's a chance that things will get weird If yeah, that's a possibility Although I didn't do anything no, it didn't do anything All I ever wanted, all I ever wanted All I ever wanted was to be your spine All I ever wanted, all I ever wanted All I ever wanted was to be your in a mouth capture And a tongue twist tied You're the web in front of a favorite lie You're a buck in my lip, you're a lash in my you're the web in front of a favorite lie Stuck a pin in your backbone Spoke it down from there All I ever wanted was to be your spine I got a magnet in my head A magnet in my head Extra thick, extra long The weight was wasted 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 Wasted. <laughs> Do you remember that song? Yeah. You remember yeah, that tune? Yeah, man. Yeah, we are I'm a, maybe a couple of years younger. We're rough. I'm I'm in the in the ballpark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of of all these songs, yeah, dude, absolutely. Um, and Eric and, Bachman, you know, who wrote that, he he went on to be Crooked Fingers and now a solo artist. I'm on his own, but his uh, everything he's made has been amazing. Like he's someone that I think at some point soon he's going to be recognized for like his contribution to songwriting because that hasn't quite happened yet because he's just a stellar songwriter. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you talk more about, so you were mm, above and beyond just a fan of this music that you're, that you're covering on this album. I mean, you were very much participating in an opening for some of the bands that, that are represented here. Can you, in case there's anybody who's just becoming familiar with, with you right now on this God live stream, forbid. can you talk yeah. a little bit about the, <laughs> um, uh, the, yeah. your, your origin and how yeah. you interacted with all these well, guys? I had a band called Noise Addict. Um, we formed in like 92 and we opened for like Sonic Youth sort of like discovered us and gave, gave us our first show and um, we supported Pavement and Fugazi and Sebado and Superchunk and um, oh Sebado and Superchunk both bands also covered on the record and um, and then the Beastie Boys put out my records on their label Graham Royal so yeah it was interesting because it was like I was part of the scene but I was also like they were all like older brothers and sisters you know they, they'd come from mm -hmm. they'd grown up on music in the 80s so it was like it even a different generation, but still it was very, it was a big thing for me to be embraced by all those artists. And I, I still wonder what was the resonating factor? What was it that drew me 
to all those artists. And I, I do think it was, um, it was something about like the, the passion and the intensity with which I attacked my work always. Like as 14 years old, I, we were the, a terrible band. I mean, like I wrote <laughs> decent pop songs, but, but we were a really terrible band, but I was delusional. And I thought they sound like we recorded on a Tascam 244. I thought it sounded like Pink Floyd's The Wall or like Appetite for Destruction. Like <laughs> my ears heard it as just epic. Like it was true, that kind of delusion you need to have as like an intense young, you know, <laughs> um, guy full of chutzpah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And if you didn't believe it, where would you be? No one else would either. There's I know, no chance. I know. So it's almost like it's taken me, you know, 25 years to develop the, the a semblance of the skills that have allowed me to, I think I'm much closer to actually hearing the music that's coming out of my fingers as similar to what I'm hearing in my head, but I'm still just getting there. It's a long journey. Sometimes I wonder if I'd have known what I was signing up for, if I'd have taken the journey, you know, because to be an artist, it's one thing if you want to be like a pop artist who just like, I don't know, gets a social media following and goes with like a fashion kind of thing almost, you know, for a couple of years and has a moment. But the, the artists I look up to are artists that like peaked in their like 50s, 60s and 70s, like people that uh, crafts people. And it's a long journey of like being, it's almost like a, the way a sword has to be put like in the fire over and over again and like, you know, in order to strengthen it. And it's, um, it's a difficult journey and it's one that like, I don't know if anyone willingly takes, you just kind of keep going one foot in front of the other and before you know it, it's too late because you don't have a backup plan, you know. <laughs> Well, man, we really appreciate you bringing this music here today. Um, we're going to hear a third one off of Quarter Century Classics, which congratulations again. It's Thank out you. in the Thank world. So it just much. came out. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully everyone gets a chance to check out the record. We the, This arrangement that you're playing here, the stripped down arrangement, yeah. sounds wonderful. The, yeah, the it's a little more built up. Like there's a great guitar player called William Tyler and um, harp player Mary Lattimore and Joey Warrenker on drums and like g- great people on the record like some big a bit of a bigger sound um also just connected to this i want to say all those bands i just sort of connected to this record i just started going through my old photo albums and um putting up a bunch of like old photos from the early 90s up on my instagram account and people are getting a real kick out of it because it's like beck and pavement and the foo fighters all these like everyone looks like babies yeah it's amazing so people can check that if they want um but yeah this song is um a sonic youth song and it's called sugarcane um in a way a perfect end today burning out their lights burning in their eyes I love your sugar cane coming from the rain kiss me like a frog turn me into flame I love you all the time I need you eight to nine I could stay all night Your body's shining And I know There's something down there Sugar soul Back to the cross Twisted lane There's something down there Sugar cane Get your light Smiling sugar life Another lover's day Another cracked up night 
every night I say The light is coming And I know There's something down there Sugar cone Back to the cross A twisted lane There's something down there Sugar cane Juliana, thank you. That sounds great. Um, and so you're in town for uh, for City Winery yesterday. Yeah, I played or last City night. Vineyard. I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. And yeah. Uh, but then there's a number of dates. You've got a half a dozen dates across North America starting January in the New Year. So January 22nd, you're at the Drake in Toronto, Cafe 939 in Boston. Um, you're in Evanston, the High Watt in Nashville, uh, Seattle. You're all over the place. And the whole thing wraps February 1st at Mississippi Studios in Portland. And yeah, um, cover the, the whole country in six days. Really touring like a grown up. You know. Yeah. <laughs> nice man. Well, enjoy it and travel safe. All the details are up at ben-lee.com and, um, and, uh, Dave Schneider of the internet. Do you know Dave from the Zambonis? Oh, Dave, yeah, right. Dave from the Zamboni says hi, and he says Archers are recording, putting out a new LP as we speak. Yes, right now. I that heard that. Happening. I was pretty excited about that. Yeah. 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 So, uh, man, thank you both for coming and playing and travel safely across all those dates and come visit us again whenever it makes Thanks sense for, for you. Us. We'll be here. Thank you. Cheers.